Welcome to The Celebration, a place for leadership, inclusion, and expression. Let's snap it up for living the best version of ourselves. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to The Celebration. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us this week. I know you've been excited for this one. We have the amazing, the brilliant, my great friend Sam as our special guest. How you doing, Sam? Excellent, excellent. How are you? Oh, man, I'm enjoying life and loving it. Thank you so much. Of course, I'm happy to be here. Yes. For, for those who don't know you as well as I do, can you share a little intro about yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, so like you said, my name is Sam. I am in Tampa, Florida. Uh, I moved to the U.S. Uh, about 10 years ago. I came here to do my master's. I got my master's in multimedia journalism at University of South Florida. Uh, been here since. I'm a social political activist in the area. I also run an incredible program called Anytown. When I'm not doing all of that, woohoo! When I'm not doing all of that, I am writing and spitting poetry every safe space that I can find. Yay! <laughs> where, where did you move from? Uh, so I moved here from India. Wonderful. From the south of India, yes. That's awesome. Did you travel by plane? Uh, yes, my friend. I traveled by plane. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I traveled by plane. Unlike Google Maps 10 years ago, which asked me to swim to the U.S., I actually <laughs> took a plane and I traveled to the state. I landed in East Lansing, Michigan, uh, because when I first came to the U.S., I went to Michigan State University. 11 months later, I realized there's no way I was going to survive that cold for the next couple of years. Dragged my ass all the way down to Florida, and I was like, yeah, this is more like it. I'm going to say it for a bit. <laughs> I've, I've moved from a state to another state, but I've never moved from one continent to another. Would you mind kind of, what's that like? It's, um, it's as scary as experience is what it is. Uh, it's, it's strange. It's, I was very excited uh, the month um, leading up to moving, you know, because it's America and you have these ideas of what America looks like and so on and so forth. Uh, and it was exciting because I'd never lived away from my parents at that point. Yeah. Um, I had always lived, I lived in the same house since I was in the ninth grade. I'd always lived in the same city, in the same vicinity. Uh, never moved houses even more than maybe three miles away from each other. And I'd lived with my parents until I was 23 years old. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're not married, uh, you're single and if you're, you're a woman, you stay with your parents. And so I did. And so it was a strange excitement, you know, but it was a lot um, leading up to doing all the applications, taking all the exams to come to the U.S. to do a graduate program. And then the last month before I left, that's when it really hit me. Because mm. mm. I, had, I, I had already had a master's degree. I'd gotten a master's degree when I was in India. I had a really good job that I loved. I was, I was in advertising and I did a lot of the pro bono accounts for nonprofit organizations. And I loved the work that I was doing. I was learning so much. I was, I was successful. There was no real reason that I needed to leave. Well, other than the fact that, you know, I'm gay and it's illegal to be gay in India. And I was, mm. I, I was, well, very, not very out, but very visually out. Yeah. Uh, so the right thing to do was to move. Like, I knew that. There was no way I could have become the person that I am today if I hadn't moved. But that was, that was, that last month really got to me. Really, I, I, I it came upon me that I was leaving everything that was familiar and everything that I knew, language included, and moving to the U.S. And so, something else. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so, a couple of things you covered that I want to follow up on. You were saying that you're gay and that it's illegal to be gay in India. Yeah. What was that like moving somewhere where, I'm not saying the U.S. is this great place of freedom, but somewhere where... It wasn't illegal anymore. What was that experience where your identity was no longer it being targeted in that way? Not very different uh, because you socialize to feel like your identity is wrong. It really doesn't matter what the legal status of it is wherever mm -hmm. you go. You know what I mean? Like now it matters to me. Now it makes a difference because I'm out and I'm very obnoxious about my identity and I'm a very queer, proud person, you know? That's awesome. Um, to the extent that I don't have to, I don't have to wear the rainbow for everybody to know it's no, I'm queer. That's how queer I am, right? 
Um, and so that, that social understanding, though, of uh, that socialization, though, of it being wrong, kept me silent for a really long time. I moved to the U.S. when I was 23 years old. I only came out when I was 26. Oh, wow. So it took a really long time for me to come out. I mean, you have to understand. I came here from India. I didn't know. The, the international office at Michigan State University was right next to the Pride office. I didn't know what Pride meant. I didn't know what rainbow colors meant. I didn't know that that's what it meant. I didn't know that that was the office for LGBTQ plus individuals. I didn't fucking know what LGBTQ plus was, pardon my language. I didn't know what LGBTQ plus was, you know? Um, so I didn't know that I could look for something. I didn't know that there was community. Everything was just very, very foreign to me. Mm. And more than me revealing myself to it, it's needed to reveal itself to me before mm. anything could happen. And so... Um, I was waiting for, I mean, I wasn't waiting for that. It just, it happened. And as it happened, I came out. And now it makes all the difference in the world because now I am an openly political human being. Now I'm an activist, you know, I advocate for these things. So now even more than ever for me, the visual of being gay and being proud and being liberated and out and uh, is more important to me than, than the politics of it because I understand how little sometimes the politics can have to do with it until yeah. you are fully inculcated in it. Mm, that's yeah. amazing. Thank you for sharing, Sam. Of course. And uh, you said you spit poetry. Would you mind sharing a poem with us? Not at all. Uh, is there anything specific you'd like to hear? Uh, whatever you're moved to, to do. I'll do a poem that is it's one of my favorite poems. Um, I deal a lot with the intersections and the tensions of gender and identity. And so I'll do a poem about that for you. Yeah. Yeah. There is nothing here but a blank slate. There is nothing here but flesh and blood and skin and bones and then she appears. She stands here naked for the first time. Body scarred with violence she's not yet feared. Face lined with stories she's not yet told. She stands here naked for the first time too long. Crouched, cringing, waiting for cover. Her Muslim heritage has taught her well that this body bears no ground for pride. And then he appears. She stands here naked for the first time. Clenched fists covering her breast. Spine erect, butch present. She stands here naked for the first time too long. He is nothing without the absence of her. She is no one without the fallacy of him. Together, they become. See, the thing about identity is we are always ready to check each other into boxes even when there's no paperwork to be done. I am an independent woman, but one of my closest friends sees a fit to call me sexist when I tell her I am uncomfortable being financially supported by a significant other even though I have no problem if she decides she does not want to work a day in her life. I ask her, to think about what she has just said. If maybe I look more feminine, she may have had a different opinion, or if maybe she would have respected the independence I learned at a young age, I must never give up by consequence of being a woman. See, we are both women. I just wear mine differently than you yours. There is a compulsory misogyny that comes with this identity that can be so blinding you completely miss the point so quick to label me in your own image. All of a sudden, I am not woman enough to understand. All of a sudden, I am not my mother's daughter, but my father's son. The thing about identity is we are always ready to tell someone else who they are so we can see ourselves in them. Universe forbid we should ever say, I don't understand, tell me more. So when I do, it appears I impose my identity upon you. Please know I am not honored by the look of surprise on your face when I tell you my pronouns are female. Please know... I'm not honored by the look of surprise on your face when I tell you consent applies to me too. Human nature requires that we destroy that which we do not understand. So we take difference and fix it into a box. One size fits too small. We peel back its skin and rip through its flesh until we break its every bone and bleed it soaking wet until there is nothing here. There is nothing here but a blank slate. There is nothing here but flesh and blood skin and bones until we disappear thank you yes thanks man. <laughs> wow that was so powerful i appreciate, appreciate it. it thank you very much yeah what what do you what do you hope that people take away from after you perform a poem like that i hope that they question their gender 
I hope that they question nuance in gender. I hope that they question the conformity of gender and the, the uh, myriad expectations that they place on somebody based on their gender and how quick we are to assume something about someone without caring enough to know anything about them. Mm. You know, um, my theory has always been interrupt the assumption after the question. Could, could you repeat that? You, you broke up just a little bit. I said, uh, my theory has always been interrupt the assumption, ask the question. Interrupt right, the assumption, of, ask the question. I love that. Mm-hmm. So sort of constantly, it's easy to assume something about someone. Everybody assumes things about everybody. That's not the bad thing. But recognizing that you assume something and carrying on with that assumption instead of saying, hey, hold on a second. Let me ask that person. You know, let me talk to them. Let me actually have a conversation with them and treat them as, like they're a real human being. Yeah. What? Well, what, what about for people who want to ask questions, but they're afraid that they're going to like offend somebody or something like that? It's okay to be afraid that you're going to offend someone. It's okay. Um, you should be afraid that you're going to offend someone because if you're not afraid that you're going to offend someone, that you are essentially assuming that you are entitled to their response or their life story or their experience or their space, you are not entitled to anything from them. Go forth with that assumption. Uh, go forth with that, that fear and uh, ask the question anyway. Come from a place of respect and you'll most likely get an answer. Come from a place of disrespect and entitlement, you get a little bit more than you bargained for in that. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. What, what do you think is like a, a starting place question or a couple questions that people could start asking for hmm. themselves? I think the first questions we need to be asking are of ourselves, right? Uh, things like, like when I, when I do writing workshops or thinking workshops, as I like to call them, cause you can't really write if you're not thinking, Ooh. um, is, um, when it comes to gender specifically, if I'm doing something, then I will ask humans, uh, mm -hmm. what is your first memory of performing gender? Mm. Right. Um, it can be as far back as when you were five years old, or it can be as recent as last week. Right. But what is your first memory of performing gender when you consciously perform an action or a role or an expectation based off of your gender. It could be as something as simple as, oh, I used the women's restroom yesterday because I'm a woman. It could be something as simple as that. But questioning that, asking yourself that, and then questioning, but why? Mm. Right? Like, why did I use the women's restroom? Why is there a women's restroom and a men's restroom? Like, yeah. What was that about? I don't use a women's restroom when I'm in my house or my friend's house. <laughs> we all use the same restroom, you know, we're all just, we're all just either um, relieving ourselves or changing or doing something that we don't do out of the ordinary in a public restroom that we are doing in, in our private restroom. So what's the difference? Questioning those, questioning those expectations that we place on ourselves. Why do we dress a certain way? Why do we look a certain way? Why are we specific about a certain type of grooming? Why are we specific about a certain type of speaking? Why are we specific about a certain type of role playing? What is that about? Where is that coming from? Mm. Those are great questions. I appreciate that. Did, did you say something about Islam in that poem? I did. I did. Um, I am raised Muslim on one side of my family. Um, I have great respect for Islam because I chose to study it after not having the most pleasant experiences with my family being raised in Islam. I do not have a healthy relationship with um, Islam. I do not have a healthy relationship with uh, my father's side of the family. Um, depends on culture, right? Uh, I understand that you identify as a Muslim, right? Tom? Yeah, I do. Yes. Your, ex your experience with Islam is likely very different from my experience with Islam because I am also Indian and Muslim. And uh, changes the context of how we practice religion, changes the context of how we practice specific religion. Um, but I still, especially in this political climate, and especially because of my documentation, I'm documented as Muslim. You take your father's religion when you're Indian. And so I'm documented as Muslim. And um, my reference specifically to that, uh, in that poem, is uh, a lot of my issues with my body and my body image and body shaming comes from my relationship with my father's son. How do you, what's it like being that vulnerable in a poem? Took me a year to write, so I think that answers your question. 
what it um it's it's uh it's a very challenging experience it's very challenging um but i think as poets i don't want to speak generally i'll speak for myself as a poet my prerogative is always my priority sorry is always speaking for that one person in the audience that needs to hear this poem you know and so yeah. that's why i write how do you find the courage to be vulnerable uh, you couldn't send me that question before this interview. <laughs> before this interview. I didn't know. I was gonna ask you. <laughs> I got to pick it. Uh, how do you find the courage to be that vulnerable? Just recognize, man, that it has to happen because there's somebody out there who needs that poem more than you do. There's somebody out there who needs needs to hear that poem more than you need to write it, and then you write it because you prioritize somebody else over yourself. Hmm. Where? How did That's you get started? How did you get started with poetry being a form of expression for you? I don't know. I've been writing poetry forever. I haven't been spitting poetry forever, but I've been writing poetry for a very long time. Um, 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 just for, you know, very page poetry, kind of very colonial poetry kind of work, right? Yeah. So I have a lot of work that I've been writing. But... Um, a friend of mine introduced me to an open mic in Ebor and said, hey, I've been wanting to go to something like this for a while. I think you'd enjoy it. I don't know why she thought I would enjoy it, but she said, I think you'd enjoy it. So we went to that open mic. It's a first Friday open mic. It happens every first Friday of the month. And we went and there were some people spitting some amazing poetry and it was awesome. And after the fact, she was like, you know, I really want to write something for the next open mic. And I said, cool, if you write something, I'll write something. And so we did. And uh, I wrote a poem called Boxes about not belonging anywhere, not fitting anywhere, and then yet trying to, wanting to fit in somewhere all the time, right? Um, and how scary that, that can be. Um, and I got a great response for it. And so I started writing little by little then, and then slowly opportunities just kept presenting themselves. And then I wrote more and I wrote more. And as it seemed more necessary, I realized that my voice, if it fit nowhere else, it at least fit in poetry and it had, it had a place, you know, and that it was, it wasn't just, it wasn't just that this is something I could do. It was something that I needed to do. Like it was my duty to do this. Like it is incumbent upon me to use my voice when so many people do not have a voice to use. Mm. And so, so I've just, I've kept on keeping on since then. That's amazing. Sounds like a purpose. Sounds like uh, a gift, something that. It is. It's a purpose. It's a purpose. It is a necessary purpose. Do you, do you, do you get pleasure from it as well? More than kind of just like a, a mission thing or raising awareness? Is there a element of joy or enjoyment in it? Of course. Of course. It is very selfish. It is incredibly cathartic to be able to do these forms. It gives me a, a relation to humans that I might otherwise never interact with. It gives me a multiplicity of relations to humans in terms of, I mean, you know, the interweb, right? The interweb. I can have my poetry heard by so many people across the world and they communicate with me, which is, is wonderful knowing that there are queer Indian humans out there who have been looking for this and you were able to provide it and you're 8,000 miles away and you never know if you'll ever meet them, but you know, they leave a comment and then they send you an email and then you can email back and forth and then you chat on Facebook and it's like, wow, that is, that is, it's so rewarding to know that everything, all the crap that you've been through in your life had a reason. And it's so that this other human does not have to go through that again. And they do not have, even if they have to go through it, they do not have to go through it alone. And Ooh. they know that, you know? You're just, I'm feeling so much inspiration and love right now. It's oh, so true. You. I mean, could you, could you share another poem with us? Yeah, of course. Um, other pigtails. This is a poem that I wrote for my mom. Right? Dear mom, pigtails are an impractical joke. Maybe that's why you laugh so hard when you look at pictures of when I was three. Tied between them so uncomfortably, pigtails are impractical and no joke because there is nothing about those pictures I recognize as me. Dear mom, when you ask if it would kill me to wear a dress once in a while, I never answer. 
how do you not hear every bone in my body crack as it screams? Just having you ask is like having you wrap your fists around my heart. Dear mum, when you saw me, I looked like a freak or a joke. I look in the mirror and tell myself that you must be lying, but that cannot be true. I am a reflection of you, and you are the most beautiful woman I have ever laid eyes on. Dear mum, Rock stars are born against the grain. Legends live to make you uncomfortable. I am so sorry I make you uncomfortable. Dear mom, you are the only person who makes me want to apologize for being me. Dear mom, you look at me and see a girl confused about being a boy. I look at me and see compassion from a thankless childhood, strength from never being enough, healing from an open wound, love from the story of grandparents. I can only envy, dear mom, I am ready and willing to give up everything that I have become to be the daughter you want me to be. Just promise me you will say a few words at my wake. I hope your eulogy begins with she was everything I wanted my daughter to be. Dear mom, you would never wish me dead, no matter how high the disappointment. I know. I love you. I just love me more. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Sam. Yeah. I I know I and the people listening right now, we feel honored that you would share something so intimate with us like that. So thank you so much. What what was the first line of that poem that you wrote? That specific one? Yeah, where did it come from? How did that poem begin when you were in your writing process? Big tales are, impra- are an impractical joke. My mom always used to like sign my hair up in different ways when I was a kid, right? And now, because we have, she has a camera phone now, and uh, back then you only had film cameras, right? But my, my mom and my aunt used to take tons of photographs with me. My aunt is an amazing photographer, so she used to take all these photographs of me and my mom together and separately and all that. And I always have like longer hair with like two ponytails or uh, pigtails or, you know, like always in a dress or in a, in a, in a frock or in a skirt. Or very, very feminine looking, very different from who I am now. And so now, because she has a camera phone, she would take pictures of the picture mm. and send it to me through WhatsApp. And it would irk me every time I saw it. Like, I know that that's the daughter that she wanted. Mm. You know, I know that that's the daughter that she wanted to raise. And I know that that's not the daughter that I grew up with. So, um, like a joke, it's like an impractical joke because you are raising someone with the expectations of them to be who you want them to be but it's a joke because you can't expect someone to be who they're not mm. that's unfair and it's unkind and, and then did you just like write the whole poem at one time did you type it did you write it with your hand how did how no. did it come about uh, my poems have a birthing process so all of my poems I don't write more than two poems a year because uh, I mean I I hope you can see, I write from a very personal space. Yeah. Uh, I write from, I write from experience, right? And so writing any one of those poems in, uh, in interaction or in coordination with all the other work that I do in my life takes a lot out of me. And uh, I have to be, I have to be careful of my health as well, you know? And so I'm cautious about each poem that I write. I want every piece to be a masterpiece, but I also want every piece to be its best truth told. I don't want to half ass anything, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so my poems have a birthing process. I think about the experience that I want to write about. I think about how I want to write about it. I write it in my head. And when it is ready, I write it on paper. Mm. And so one of our other guests, Xavier, said he writes all. Do you know Xavier? Of course. Yeah, he writes all his poems in his head first, too. Yep, yep. So that's interesting. It has, yeah, it has to come to fruition, you know, and it, it's always a feeling. It has to feel right. Yeah. If it feels right, it will tell you it feels right. What, what is the feeling that you were searching for to know it was right for that poem? For all of my poems, honestly, uh, it's just, it's urgent. Once it's ready to be written, it's urgent. It's a feeling of urgency. It's like, I have to get this down now, which doesn't happen. If I try to write a poem before it's ready to be written and it's still playing out in my head, um, it won't feel, it, it doesn't feel like 
it, it makes me stop. It's like, you know, it's, this is not the time. This is not the time. Mm. That happens. You know, very consciously that happens. That's amazing. And we want to let everybody that's listening know that Sam is going to be our feature for this month's live and online expression session, which is on April 23rd at noon Pacific Standard Time to 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we're going to have a writing workshop. We're going to explore. You really get to have a great sense of community. And the whole experience culminates with Sam doing a live feature. And so if you're interested in joining that, you can head over to tomearl.com slash events and register. And if you want to look at the show notes and find out ways to connect with Sam, you can do that at tomearl.com slash Sam. And all of the show notes and ways to get a hold of Sam will be in there. Um, Sam, what, what are any last thoughts you'd like to leave with our guests? Um, I would love to extend this conversation in our feature. I will do some poetry for y'all. I can't wait. Um, a lot of my poetry is around the tensions of identity, intersectionality specifically, and immigration. And Sam, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that you all join us and learn more about Sam. Sam is going to be our feature. That's going to be at noon Pacific Standard Time, 2 p.m. if you're in the Midwest, 3 p.m. if you're on the East Coast, 8 p.m. if you're in Nigeria, or that is also London time. So join us live. It is free. It's an amazing opportunity to connect with artists from all around the world. And at the same time, get to see a live performance by Sam And at the same time, you're going to get to create something during the writing workshop. So please join us. That is on April 23rd. Once again, to register, that is tomearl.com slash events. And if you want the show notes and to connect with Sam to continue the conversation and connect with Sam on social media or anything like that, you can find that at tomearl.com slash Sam, S-A-M. Thank you so much for joining us this week at the celebration. As always, I'm wishing you peace and blessings.